you know, disasters are, are a new way of life. You know, they're, they're no longer these sort of anomalous events. Um, they sometimes feel anomalous because um, a lot of them aren't covered by the media and they don't really sort of capture our attention. Um, but, you know, we live in a world of increasing storms and increasing storm frequency. Uh, you know, Arctics don't want to personally get involved in disaster. I think it's something that people need to be aware of as a new urban condition. Episode 140. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Today is the second half of my interview with Eric Kessel. Eric J. Kessel is an architect, writer, and author of the book Down Detour Road, published by MIT Press. He's also the former executive director of Architecture for Humanity. Eric, welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be back. Eric, you've spent a lot of time in, of your career focused on disaster areas. Mm -hmm. I would love to get a little bit of insight into what it's like to be on the ground after these disasters. Um, that would take a much longer interview. Uh, and in fact, uh, Can you, just, is there a digest uh, version? Took, took a up, digest uh, version. Uh, an entire new book. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, I think disaster gives you a window into life and into civilization and into architecture that it's impossible to experience, um, you know, in our, our sort of day to day existence. Um, you know, large natural disasters by their nature um, deconstruct, you know, the, the sort of social and physical systems of a city or a town or, or a population. Um, and through the recovery process, you get to see a lot of that getting rebuilt. So, so much of what we know about, you know, our own space, our own civilization, the, the city that we live in, the, the office where we work, the sort of thing, they're just sort of givens. Um, you know, we weren't there for their creation. Um, so we don't fully understand the processes that sort of drove the decisions and, and resulted in, you know, this life that we currently have. And I think disasters in, in some ways, um, they don't take things back to zero, but you get close. Um, and you know what's left behind in the wake of a disaster are the people, um, the survivors, their values, um, their fears, their insecurities, their dreams for their children, um, and their their spirit. And that really becomes the basis for recovery, either good or bad or stalled. Um, and it's I, I've always maintained that disaster is sort of a prism through which you can look and examine you know issues of urbanity and civilization and, and architecture and contemporary practice. And, you know, I've, I've always done what I did out of, you know, a sense of moral duty and, you know, wanting to help people that, that needed help. Um, but even purely at an intellectual level, I think for me, it was, um, you know, a place to see architecture and urbanity and civilization being rendered in real time um, and to understand the influence that a designer can have in that process. Mm. How has your, your view of architecture changed from being in these disaster areas? Well, I, I hard to believe, but I think architecture is even more important um, than I did when I, I wrote Down Detour Road, because I think that, you know, experiences like that viscerally connect you to what architecture does for people. And I think, you know, people in the developed world take their architecture for granted, especially when it's not architecture with a capital A, you know, it's just a house, it's just an office. I mean, these are sort of basic things. Um, but, you know, when when a, a landscape has been stripped of its built environment, you really get a sense of um, how much that built environment was really contributing to public health, um, to um, public security, to um, public wealth and, and private wealth. And, you know, it's the sort of glue that was keeping civilization together and it has been for, you know, 40,000 years. 
Um, so I think, um, you know, my view of architecture is that it's, it's more important than I ever thought it was. And I thought it was really, really important. And I think my view of the architect has gotten significantly more expanded. Um, so, you know, I began down teacher road with what some people consider was an expansive idea of what an architect could be, you know, that an architect could have, you know, these sort of, um, what might conventionally be understood as extraneous capacities and sort of fold that into the design process. And I think, you know, my experience in disaster and working with a lot of, you know, other folks of a similar mind, um, to me challenges architects to be even more than that, um, to, you know, be a part of, you know, the sort of intimate social fabric of, of rebuilding um, and to really heal the world. Um, you know, disasters are, are a new way of life. You know, they're, they're no longer these sort of anomalous events. Um, they sometimes feel anomalous because um, a lot of them aren't covered by the media and they don't really sort of capture our attention. Um, but, you know, we live in a world of increasing storms and increasing storm frequency. Um, you know, for the first time in history, the, the U.S. Geological Survey is being forced to track what they call induced seismicity, uh, which is a fancy term for earthquakes caused by people. Um, and all over the world, um, you know, through fracking and other sort of human activity, um, we're starting to cause earthquakes. Um, so this is the new normal. And I think um, even to the extent that you know, architects don't want to personally get involved in disaster. I think it's something that people need to be aware of as a new urban condition. Fascinating. Talking about this as a new urban condition. Uh, what are some of the challenges maybe or unexpected? I just want to, really want to kind of experience that if I can a little bit through you. But it being in these disaster areas, can you give us a glimpse of what is it like? You, you mentioned how things break down. Because besides just chaos, what? How does that affect the the society and the fabric? Just in in terms of specific disasters that you've been in, mm -hmm. can you give us some anecdotes or some experiences from those disasters that would help us understand what it's like to be in a situation like that? Well, certainly physically, it's very hard, um, and you know, not for the, the the sort of faint of heart. I mean, there's. Um, you know, physical commitment that you make to going into a situation that is, you know, remote and uncomfortable and potentially dangerous and, and these sorts of things. Um, I think spiritually it's the opposite because disasters have a way of drawing out the best in people. Um, and, you know, being in a disaster zone and, and working for survivors, um, you know, every architect in your audience has, you know, had that one really great client and then one really terrible client. Um, pretty much all of my clients have been awesome. Um, you know, they're just, they're great people that you love working for. Um, and I think being witness to that in so many locations and watching, you know, communities come together and, and people help each other and people get involved in a dialogue about, you know, what is the best future for our city rather than, you know, what is the best future for me and mine. Um, I think it allows you to sort of touch and, and see a window and, you know, in terms of specific disasters, I see that in every disaster. So, you know, in disasters as kind of culturally diverse as, um, you know, the Haiti earthquake and the tsunami in Japan, you see communities reacting in a very similar way. And that is, you know, banding together, being thoughtful, looking out for one another, um, at the same time, sort of challenging the future and, you know, asking, you know, how do we stop this from happening again? How do we make something better than what was existing before? Um, and that's a really amazing energy to be around. Um, you know, I think it's it can be exhausting, so it's important to be, um, you know, not only with people that, um, you know, are of the same mind and of the same level of commitment, um, but also to have support structures around you. I mean, I, I never could have done what I have done with my career without you know, my family and my circle of friends that um, I think Paul Farmer said it best when he said that lives of service uh, depend on lives of support. Um, and I think, you know, to go into that place, you really need to have people around you that are going to sort of, you know, hold you up uh, as you move through that landscape. Um, it's, uh, I, I think in terms of, you know, the pure architecture and the design thinking that you go through, you really have to challenge everything. Um, and you know, it's funny, I, I sort of, uh, actually in the, in the new book, I make a comparison, you know, uh, working in the private sector, which I did for a while, um, you know, many, many years ago, um, you know, if you want 
steal your foundation, you know, you just write, you know, four number four bars and everything else works itself out, right? So the structural engineer checks that, does the calcs, makes sure that it works. Um, you know, the contractor knows what that is, orders it from the supplier, it shows up from the supplier, it's been inspected, nobody has to think really hard about, you know, what goes into a foundation. Um, in a disaster zone, you really have to sort of think about everything from the ground up, right? So, you know, you're doing a school in Haiti, um, and, you know, you need to get the toilets to work. So that means water. Um, so you start thinking, okay, well, we'll do water collection and we'll do some cisterns. Well, the problem is that, you know, Haiti has a wet and a dry season and, you know, water uh, degrades. Certainly you've got to kind of keep it clean and, and do all this stuff. But, you know, there's four or five months of the year where Haiti really does not get, you know, a lot of rain. So that means, you know, a massive amount of water storage. It also means that you have to pump it, which means you need electricity, which is, you know, non-existent or unreliable in large parts of, you know, the Asian landscape. So that means solar panels, but solar panels, you know, are sort of a thriving black market. I mean, they're easily stolen and, you know, they're worth something. So, you know, there's this sort of whole design process that you get into um, that you avoid in, in developed countries like the U.S. just because, you know, our antecedents have figured out so much of this stuff. Um, and, you know, we sort of take it for granted. So, you know, I've always told people that, you know, the sort of design work that you do in, you know, disaster zone, um, in a way amplifies the challenges and, you know, almost calls on you to be more of a designer because, you know, you are having to sort of problem solve on the fly and break down problems to their core. You know, there's no shortcuts. There's no taking anything for granted. Um, you really have to think about, you know, every little thing that you're doing and essentially um, forego the, you know, 150 years of practice that we've had in the United States that creates conveniences that, you know, modern architects uh, here now stand on. So, and, and that gets back to my point about disasters being a lens through which we can kind of look at, you know, contemporary issues in, in architecture and there's no sense in sort of rolling back the clock for 150 years. Um, I do think it, it challenges you in ways that conventional practice does not. You mentioned that you mentioned a school. What are some of the other specific projects that you've been involved in in these post-disaster areas? Um, so architecture communities work uh, usually focused on community level projects and it was animated by the idea that um, you know most people in the world actually build their own homes. Um, you know if you add up all seven billion people um, pretty much everybody gets their home from themselves or their cousin who, you know, lives down the street or something like that. Um, people have a much harder time making their own hospitals and their own schools. Um, you know, that's the sort of thing that sort of requires collective energy. And, you know, after a disaster when, you know, the local governments may be tapped, budgets are tapped, all those things, an organization can have a lot of impact coming in and you know, rebuilding a school or a hospital or a public park or a small business or things like that. I think, you know, we always look for projects that were catalytic um, in the sense that, you know, if you do this one project, it will spur the development of three other projects because, you know, all of a sudden there's a sense of doing that. You know, you put a school here, um, people are going to gather around it because parents want to send their kids to go to the school. Um, and that means somebody is going to want to build, you know, a little market you know, in that neighborhood or, you know, an auto service store or something. So, you know, there are ways to think about this at a neighborhood level or an urban level that actually um, inform the sort of projects that you select. Um, so generally speaking, you know, we were looking at, um, you know, either small businesses, schools, clinics. Um, the, the organization had a big portfolio in sports for social change, um, but that was sort of outside of the, the disaster sphere. Um, but I think, you know, the common thread, the, the unifying spirit was, you know, architecture is a community device, you know, architecture is something that can, um, bring people together and empower communities and, you know, have that sort of catalytic effect where all of a sudden you're seeing, you know, secondary and tertiary benefits associated with that first project that, that you did. Um, and we're all trained this way, right? I mean, I think, you know, conventional architecture training, like, um, gives you some of those ideas, you know, going back to architecture school, or just rarely a chance to implement it, right? Because, you know, architecture is by and large a fee for service economy and a client comes and says, you know, I want to, you know, do a cheesecake factory over there. And it's like, you say no, or you say yes, but you know, you're not in a position to sort of make those sorts of choices. 
Um, and that was another thing that you know I, I love about humanitarian work is that you are in a position to to make those sorts of choices in concert with you know the community members themselves and you know the people that are going to be using those sorts of facilities. And you know when it's something as integral to the community as a school or a clinic, people have a voice. They have very specific ideas about you know what they want and what they need out of that. Um, so it's. Um, extremely rewarding in, in that respect. Hmm. What are your thoughts, um, having been focused on this disaster relief humanitarian architecture for a while, you know, what are your thoughts about the business model of um, architecture as a nonprofit? We know mm-hmm. that, you know, Architecture for Humanity had, you know, the, the main office went bankrupt sometime last year, so there was a little bit of a, a scandal around that. Is Is it is it economically feasible to be able to have that kind of business model? Is there hope in the future for getting really qualified people on the ground in these areas and uh, continuing the work that you were doing? Well, I, I, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, our architecture community was around for 15 years. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't let the, you know, the, the ultimate bankruptcy sort of overshadow, you know, the fact that, you know, something like 2 million people worldwide, you know, are now living and, and working, going to school and, and projects done by architecture for humanity. So, I mean, I think it is possible to be successful over the long term. Um, but I think that's that's sort of a gimme question. You know, the, the fact is it's necessary. Um, the fact is that, um, you know, by some estimates, 75% of all construction in the next 20 years is going to be done in the global south. Um, we are certain, I don't know, I hope we're certain that, you know, climate change is real and getting worse. Um, urbanization is accelerating rapidly. Um, I think we have to figure it out. I mean, there's just no other option. So I think that, um, you know, is it possible to, to have a, a sustainable nonprofit business model? Yeah, it, it certainly is. And, um, you know, people are doing it kind of all the time. Um, I think that, uh, it becomes more necessary as the world evolves the way that it does. And, you know, there should be constant energy and, and attention and interest in, in sort of developing new business models and, um, you know, throwing more energy and more love and, and more attention and, you know, these emerging problems because, you know, they're, they're going to swallow us up. Um, it's the world is just moving in this direction. And, you know, I think the only architects that I, have disagreements with from time to time um, are the ones who just want to like, you know, sit behind the castle walls and pretend like all of this stuff is not happening. It's happening and the world is changing. And I think that the profession of architecture has a choice to, you know, try and sit it out um, and pretend like nothing's happening or to get involved with a lot of other professions and, you know, try and um, make the world into the world that we know it could be. So what is your focus and passion right now, Mm -hmm. Eric? Um, so 2015, I've been writing, um, you know, I decided to write a sequel to, to Down Detour Road. Um, and, you know, it's, it sort of picks up where Down Detour Road left off, but is also informed by the last five years of disaster practice. And I, I would say that, you know, my research, my scholarship in the past year has been principally focused on, you know, the relationship between the profession of architecture and, and the problems in which I just spoke. Um, you know, we have these sort of emergent social problems that without question are, are getting worse. And, you know, it's easy to sort of um, have a bunch of nightmares about the collision between climate change and urbanization, you know, as a sort of self-reinforcing loop um, that just makes each problem worse uh, by virtue of, you know, their interaction with each other. Um, and, you know, how do we rethink the profession of architecture? And I don't mean reinvent it from the ground up necessarily, but you know, what do we need to start doing now to make sure that the, you know, graduating architect 20 years from now um, is positioned to, to work in this world um, and has the skill sets and the qualifications to be a meaningful contributor to society. Um, I think that uh, a lot of our kind of urban problems and physical problems are self-reinforcing at this point. And, you know, climate change and urbanization and industrialization is, you know, sort of a great example. Um, and you sort of look at the last 40 years, um, you know, in the 1970s, the United States, we got really panicky about the environment. And we realized that it probably was not a great idea 
to, you know, pour toxic sludge into our rivers and, you know, have coal plants next to the kindergarten and stuff like that. So we passed some very aggressive environmental leg legislation, which was well thought out. Um, and then we just started moving all of our manufacturing abroad. Um, and, you know, it's a, an election year, so these issues are sort of getting casually tossed around. But the reality is that, you know, we move most of our manufacturing to China, um, and at least in part because the environmental regulations were lax there. Um, and of course, they created a ton of climate change there, which now drifts across the Pacific and affects us anyway. Um, so I don't think that every architect has a responsibility to solve the whole world necessarily. But I think that, you know, these sorts of questions have to be embedded with practice. Um, we have to be thinking about, um, okay, when we take a commission to, to do this building uh, in this place, um, how is that ultimately affecting, you know, these issues which are affecting everything else? Um, so the sequel is, um, I guess, in a sentence, it's, you know, a sequel to Down Detour Road that it takes the, the philosophy of Down Detour Road and sort of tests it in the crucible of disaster um, and comes out with some thoughts about, you know, the role that um, a designer, uh, a, an architect or, or any of the design professions can actually play in solutions to some of these problems. Mm. What is the title of the book? His Mortal Hands, um, which sounds very religious, but it's not. Um, it's actually a reference to Kennedy's inauguration speech. Um, and in one line, he he says that man hands in his mortal hands the power to obliterate all forms of human life uh, or all forms of human poverty. And, you know, in the last 50 years, we've essentially moved on from you know, the prevailing existential threat of that time, which was, you know, global nuclear annihilation. That's the world that my parents grew up in. We're not really afraid of that anymore on a day-to-day -day basis. But in some senses, we inherited something much more pernicious. Um, we are destroying the world just much more slowly. Um, and, you know, we're taking actions with, uh, you know, irreversible consequences. So, you know, I think what Kennedy said is still hugely applicable in the sense that, you know, we do have, we possess the technology and the wealth to uh, distinguish all forms of human life or all forms of human poverty. And I think that, um, you know, every choice we make must ultimately fall in, in one of those two camps. You know, we've got to be working towards one um, or we're working towards the other. You know, there's no sort of middle path um, through that world. Mm. Maybe that's a little dramatic. I don't know. It's a working title. <laughs> <laughs> it's a working title. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, uh, the majority of architects, at least here in the U.S., are very focused on uh, the work that their clients want them to do. You know, it is it is a client-driven business. What Do you have any suggestions or thoughts about how we as architects can um, take our social consciousness that we all have? You know, most architects I speak to, all of them, want to do things that are environmentally sustainable and, and help the environment and make the world a better place. Uh, and yet sometimes they feel at odds with the needs of their clients that may not necessarily focus on those things as much. Sure. Um, well, first of all, uh, you know, let me agree with what you said in terms of, you know, all of us feeling a sense of social responsibility. I think that, you know, architecture sometimes um, gets artificially divided into some, you know, fairly cartoonish white hat and black hat camps and um you know certainly i've i've encountered architects that you know feel like uh the only way to do good is to do what i do and you know move to some foreign land and, and do all this stuff and i've equally met architects who think that you know anybody who works at a big corporate firm is you know by their nature soulless crass materialists that you know don't care about humanity um i think the nature of architectural training and the nature of architectural intent um, you know, breeds a social concern. And I think you're absolutely right that, um, you know, the tension within the profession is that sort of intrinsic concern for one's environment, one's built environment, one's community, um, butts up against, you know, the commercial interests of, you know, what is essentially a profession for the 1%. And I don't mean that in the pejorative, it's just that buildings are expensive. And like, usually people will not pay to design buildings unless they intend on building one. And, you know, just by the nature of things, architects end up kind of working for the 1%. Um, and it's in that vein that, you know, I would offer two things. Um, one, I think we need to stick together. Um, and I think that, you know, architects should be vocal about 
um, you know, their interest in this and their support for one another. Um, you know, I think unfortunately, architecture, because margins are so thin, can get a bit mercenary at times um, and sometimes becomes something of a race to the bottom. And, you know, I've seen situations where, you know, it's the architect who's willing to do whatever the client wants and take any fee uh, that gets the job. And that person ends up exerting a lot of pressure on you know, their architectural community um, to do work below what what they're capable of doing and below what they should be doing. So, um, you know, I'd like to see architects be, you know, not stabbing each other with pitchforks necessarily, but, you know, understand that, you know, architecture is more important than architects, right? And when we elevate architecture, it, it helps us all. Um, so, you know, anything that sort of devalues architecture, you know, we should put a flashlight on it and, you know, examine it very carefully. The second thing that I would offer is that, um, you know, I've always felt very strongly about the idea of architect as educator. Um, you know, as a professional, it's not the architect's job to do whatever the client wants. Um, it's the architect's job to bring to the client their expertise and their wisdom and their training and their passion and say, you know, these are the possibilities. Um, this is what could be done. These are the consequences of this choice and that choice. Um, and, you know, I don't work in private practice, obviously, but if I did, um, you know, I, I could see myself having a conversation where I say, look, you know what, um, if you do the project this way, like building's gonna come out like this and, you know, you're gonna make a 12% return, right? Um, if you do the project this way, the building's gonna come out like this, you're gonna make an 11% return, but you know what, it's gonna have, you know, all these catalytic beneficial effects for the community around it, you know, is that important to you? And, you know, I'm not naive. There are going to be some clients who say, to hell with that, you know, I'll take the 12%. I don't care about the community. Um, but I think, you know, at the very least, it puts the architect in the position of making a choice and understanding where their own values are. Um, you know, any teacher in any capacity um, can't, you know, force knowledge into the mind of a student. In that same way, a professional cannot force knowledge into the mind of a client. What they can do is be responsible about saying, hey, you know, these are the effects of your choices, you know, and you may be able to get away with it via, you know, the code or the zoning board or anything like that. I personally don't feel like it's the right thing. It's not something that you should be doing. Um, and if your client values your opinion, you know, maybe that that sort of weighs for something. So I think those two things, when taken in concert, you know, one, sticking together, and two, playing the role of the educator, you know, advance the profession along the lines that, that you were talking about and allow, you know, private sector architecture to, to be a force for good. And I think that's, you know, an important front on, you know, the war for the profession and, and the war for the planet. Um, you know, there will always be a certain number of architects who want to, you know, throw everything in a backpack uh, move to some developed country and, you know, practice with mud on their boots. And, you know, I've done that and thousands of other people have too. Um, but I think in order to really elevate architecture, you know, the, the design principles that, you know, this prestigious, you know, Manhattan firm um, have to take as seriously their role as citizen architects and to have to understand that being a citizen architect does not require them to have mud on their boots, right? It just requires the conscientiousness about the impact of this design choice on, you know, the community, the city, the planet, the client, um, and those sorts of things. And, um, you know, back to down to a row, that's one of the reasons that Citizen Architect is the last chapter in the book is because, you know, I think that's what's most important is to restore the idea of the architects as an educated public servant who elevates the discussions in which he or she participates in. Um, you know, not as a mercenary that just does, you know, whatever the money wants them to do and not as some hopeless idealist that just sort of wanders the world, you know, taking care of crisis after crisis, um, but uniformly and consistently um, a profession and a group of professionals that make the world better wherever they are. Eric, it's been an, an very enjoyable interviewing you today. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> likewise, is, likewise. Yeah. Is, is, there, is there a question that I that I haven't asked you that you wish I would have or or that I should have asked you that I didn't um you know I'm certain that I will think of that question five minutes after we disconnect <laughs> no I mean I've enjoyed our discussion and I think we we touched on the important things I mean I think that um 
you know, humanitarian architecture has in some circles become a cause du jour. You know, it's something that people find very kind of exciting and, and romantic. And, you know, the, the problems of urbanization and climate change uh, are starting to float into that territory where they're so big and so terrifying that like, we don't even want to deal with them anymore. It's just like, uh, you know, shit, the planet's going to hell, like there's nothing left to be done. Um, and I think, you know, what's next for both humanitarian architecture and architecture in general is, you know, sort of reevaluation and more sophisticated understanding of, you know, the role that each of us can play in our day-to-day -day decisions um, and the orientation of the architect towards society. Um, you know, are we going to be educators? Are we going to be kings? Are we going to be sorcerers? Um, are we going to be, uh, you know, goofy, effete intellectuals that just sort of hang out in the, the fringe of society while, you know, other people make all the important decisions? Um, I think these are questions that we all need to be asking every day. Um, and we need to be kind of fighting for answers every day. So in that sense, um, yeah, we, we covered all of my, my passion topics. Well, great. Thank you for prodding us to ask those questions, Eric. Likewise. Eric Kessel is a writer, architect, author of the book Down Detour Road, and his forthcoming book, which is tentatively titled In His Mortal Hands. Thank you. Have you thought about starting your own practice, or are you looking to take your practice to the next level? If so, I wanted to let you know that free registration for the 2016 Architecture Business Plan Competition opens on December 1st, 2015. Start your planning process now and enter for a chance to win a grand prize of $10,000. Five finalists will be flown to Philadelphia to present their full plans to four industry-leading jurors. Travel and lodging are provided. So this is a one-of-a-kind competition. It's open to all licensed architects in the United States and Canada who are planning to start a new firm within one year or currently own a firm that is less than 10 years old. Visit archbusinessplan.com to learn more. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.